ARM is always moving uh, things forward and cutting edge innovation. I think maybe we're innovating this morning. This may be the largest panel I recall us ever being part of. If we had one more, we're going to fall off the stage, I think. But um, I think you'll uh, share my uh, pleasure of this group. It's a very, very distinguished group. I was trying to do some quick math uh, last week, but I think we have more than 100 years worth of collective regenerative medicine experience among this group here um, in uh, different uh, capacities. And so they're going to share a lot of their insights this morning. Uh, what we thought we'd do, uh, we've got a full hour, which is, is really uh, a luxury, um, is we'll go through initially some introductions where they can highlight uh, both their uh, current role as well as some of their background. Um, and then we have uh, a series of questions. A couple of starter questions actually came from uh, the ARM board to, uh, I think, move us slowly down the path till we get into some more of the controversial, uh, less agreeable areas. And then finally, the last 10 or 15 minutes, we'll open it up for uh, audience questions. So please um, uh, think about those as we go forward. So I will, uh, uh, we'll, we'll just continue to go uh, across the stage. So Devin, if you want to lead us off uh, with introductions, I appreciate it. All right, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear me, but I'm number seven on your... Uh, Seven right. on your program. All right, can you hear me Number now? Number one in your heart. All right, great. So Devin Smith, uh, CEO at Arbor Bio. We are a uh, next generation gene editing company founded just over four years ago by a uh, co-founded by Fong Zhang and David Walt. And the premise was uh, Cas9 was the, not the best nucleases found, it was the first that worked. And that was sort of the foundation for everything. And so the premise for Arbor was, why don't we go out and actually take a more strategic view, look at the metagenome and identify those uh, a suite of nucleases that have differentiated characteristics allowing us to do uh, more sophisticated genome editing. So that was the, the basis for uh, Arbor Bio. We're about 55 people in Cambridge, Mass. Prior to Arbor, I was uh, COO at Siglon Therapeutics, which is an encapsulated cell therapy company. And before that was at Pfizer, spent a few years as COO of the regenerative medicine group there. So. I don't know how many of that 100 years I account for, Tim, but <laughs> some of it. A anyway, substantial part. A little bit. Anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm Emma McBurney, Vice President of Business Development at Biogen. Um, so at Biogen, we are pioneering uh, advances in neuroscience uh, broadly, um, but in particular, we're making um, several investments in gene therapy. So since I've joined Biogen, we've signed uh, with two years ago, we actually signed nine deals in gene therapy um, across a broad range of cargo as well as delivery technologies. Um, and so prior to joining Biogen, um, I spent five years at Sanofi Genzyme in the rare disease business unit, um, most recently as head of rare disease business development there. Um, and then prior to that, my background is in M&A and finance. And so I'm pleased to join the panel today. Thank you very much, Emma. Hi, everyone. I'm Leslie Meltzer, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Orchard Therapeutics. And Orchard is a company very focused on transforming the lives of patients with rare and severe genetic diseases. And we do this by leveraging the potential of a hematopoietic stem cell-based gene therapy. We have um, over 160 patients treated across um, six, over six indications focused primarily in the neurometabolic disease space as well as in the immunology space. Uh, we are actively launching our first approved lentiviral gene therapy program, um, LibMeldi for metachromatic leukodystrophy in Europe. And we are very pleased with the, the success of these programs in terms of the durability of, of efficacy and safety in patients with a, um, over 10 years of follow-up and some of the first patients treated. My background, I'm trained as a neurobiologist. I've been working in the industry for over 10 years, focused predominantly in the rare disease space. Did a stint at Biogen myself, um, working in hemophilia and multiple sclerosis there as well, and just really excited about the potential of our platform. Thanks for having me today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very much, uh, Leslie. Hi, everyone. I'm Patrick Boyle. I'm the head of code base at Ginkgo Bioworks. I think I'm an outlier on this panel for a couple of reasons. One, I'm a microbiologist by training. Um, and two, I'm coming from Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a company that doesn't develop any cell or gene therapy products of our own. Instead, we're a synthetic biology platform that uses software and automation to accelerate the development of products for, for others. So, you know, we're relatively new to this uh, space, actually started moving into uh, supporting nucleic acid vaccine uh, development and manufacturing uh, during the pandemic. So we partnered with Moderna um, uh, early on to help optimize the manufacturing of raw materials for then their COVID-19 vaccine candidates. 
Um, we've also worked with uh, Aldebron to optimize manufacturing of vaccinated capping enzyme. Um, and in the uh, AAV space, we're partnered with uh, Biogen as well um, around improving manufacturability of, of uh, their AAV work. So uh, from my perspective, again, you know, we're, we're really here to partner. We're a platform company uh, that looks to help others accelerate the development of their products. And I apologize if I make any mistakes because of my microbiology background. <laughs> no apologies necessary, Patrick. Probably we could have an entire uh, session just on your uh, Moderna interactions over the last couple of years. Probably you could write a book about that. Um, you can always seal it down. Yeah, my name is Peter Nell. Um, I'm CBO and Head of Therapeutics at Mammoth Biosciences, and, and Devin represents here the, the Broad Institute kind of spin out, and there must be something from Berkeley as well in gene editing, right? So. Um, Mammoth Biosciences is a company uh, co-founded by Jennifer Doudna, and it's also focusing on novel CRISPR systems with a very specific focus on extremely small CRISPR systems, way smaller than Cas9 and what has been out there before. And I think the other interesting aspect of Mammoth is that we have branched the discovery arm into two applications, diagnostics using CRISPR technology, and then also the therapeutics um, part. Previously, I had co-started Casibia, which was the joint venture between Bayer and CRISPR Therapeutics, or Bayer in the U.S. for um, U.S. friends. And um, that is now fully owned by CRISPR Therapeutics. Um, it was one of the, the or actually it was the first um, company that was founded by Bayer Leaps, the, the venture arm of Bayer, and then Blue Rock, where Emil was before, um, was actually the second company out of that. And I had been at Bayer before for 16 years, um, worked in various functions. I'm a chemist by training, um, but then moved on more towards strategic functions, operations, commercial. And when I became responsible for hematology licensing, that's when I started looking back in 2010, 11 into gene therapy. It was just coming back up. As you might know, Bayer was already involved in the early days <clears throat> in 2000. 99-2000 with Avigen, the very first gene therapies for hemophilia um, that was then stopped. And so trying to get Bayer back into the, the gene therapy field, I had to do a lot of work internally. Um, but then um, we signed one deal with uh, Dimension Therapeutics at that time, coming out of Regenix Bio, um, that is now owned by Ultragenix in hemophilia A. And so since then, I've been following the field of gene therapy. And then for sure, when the CRISPR paper came out in 2012, that's what excited us uh, pretty much, and since then, following the field. Thank you very much, Peter. And last but not least. Hi. Um, my name is Emil Neweser. I'm the president and CEO of Insoma. Uh, we are a precision uh, in vivo engineering genetic medicines company with the ability to precisely engineer the hematopoietic system. Um, with a one-time, uh, simple off-the-shelf treatment, you can, in theory, engineer any or all cells of the blood system. Um, it's based on a third generation adenoviral vector system that's highly, by a billion years of evolution, precise for the HSC compartment, but it's been further engineered, um, stripped of all its viral components, so it's what you might call gutless, um, and um, that provides even, and it's also been engineered for further precision. It has sort of two fundamental advantages. The first is the simplicity of it, it's portable. So um, that portability, we think, will democratize genetic medicine because all you need is a needle, um, in theory, to, to uh, engineer the blood compartment. And we think that opens up new diseases where you really, the patient can't tolerate the existing regimen, and also new geographies where simply they don't have access to healthcare systems like we have in our most modern systems here in the US or Europe. Um, so it's that democratization of genetic medicine and, and uh, also the payload capacity of the platform is sort of unprecedented. It's about 10x the current systems, 30, 35, 37 KB, um, which means you can multiplex for the first time, I think, it's certainly in vivo. And um, what that means is that you can engineer multiple nodes simultaneously of the blood system. We can, in theory, not only control individual cells like T cells or B cells or red blood cells, but we can control several of them simultaneously. So you can pick the best cell for the disease, This, for example, a simple genetic disease, but you can also maybe engineer multiple nodes simultaneously for complex disease like oncology and autoimmunity. So, um, and we think that multiplexing will lead to a new generation of in, in vivo systems biology, basically. Um, we, you know, so it's, it's a new generation of smart immune cells. 
would be the way I'd say it. Um, prior to this, and, and I am currently the chair of Blue Rock Therapeutics, I was the CEO of the company and involved in its growth and running it after the acquisition by Bayer. I'm also uh, had the honor of being the chair of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. So. Which one of those are your day jobs, Emma? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> or all of them. It's a little complicated. Well, I think you'll agree. Um, with, this is a very diverse panel. You know, if you think about uh, the backgrounds here, the size of the companies, the locations of the companies, the roles of the panelists, and the technologies they're using. So we're going to jump right in. What we decided in the planning, uh, sometimes with three or four panel members, you tend to have either repetition or you step on each other. So prior to a question going out, we're going to just identify one or two panelists to be the primary answers, and anybody else can jump in. So uh, Emma and Patrick, the first one directed towards you primarily. Um, there are so many new approaches with different uh, functionalities for genetic medicine. Many have uh, fundamental limitations that uh, we can't design enough of them. Specifically, we can't get them to the sites that we want to get them to. What is the solution and how are the current tech, uh, tech platforms thinking about solving this? So we'll start out, Emma, if you want to uh, give us your thoughts on that question. Yeah, so I would say we think about this a lot at Biogen, in particular with CNS gene therapies. So for example, if we want to treat Alzheimer's disease, um, we need diffuse um, and broad transduction in the brain. Um, and so current technologies, at least that have been used in humans, um, you know, we don't believe we'll be able to achieve this. So we are, um, both actively internally as well as ex via external collaborations, um, pursuing multiple different approaches, whether it's novel capsids. So ideally, we would discover a BBB crossing capsid that could get broad distribution in the brain. Um, but also, we're exploring you know, m different modes of delivery. Are there devices that can enable this delivery? Um, and I would say it's primarily on, on AAV, but also we're, we're interested in non-viral delivery approaches that could potentially cross the BBB as well. Um, and so that's kind of in the CNS. And then I would say, in addition to that, we have neuromuscular as a core therapeutic area at Biogen. And so, you know, I think with DMD and, and a lot of the other um, you know, advances that have been made in the clinic, we've seen some of the drawbacks of particularly the high doses that need to be delivered um, to achieve transduction in muscle. And so we're, you know, approaching this from multiple angles, whether it's, you know, are there, are there capsids that could better uh, be more potent for delivery to muscle? Um, as well as potentially, you know, manufacturing collaborations with companies like Ginkgo to address, you know, the, the high cost of manufacturing for high-dose um, gene therapy. And then finally, in, in ophthalmology, um, I think that this is a more advanced field in terms of, you know, the current first generation of gene therapies, but um, we have our first generation are uh, retinal diseases, and so in order to deliver to the retina, um, the current first-generation procedure is quite invasive, and so we're, we're, we have a partnership with a company called Vigeneron, um, who's discovered a next-generation intravitreal delivered capsid that can um, achieve delivery to the retina. And so those are some examples of what we're doing to address this challenge. I don't know, there's a lot of different solutions, I think. I don't know if we know today the, the solution to these many challenges, and I think it will end up being a number of different solutions that may have to be tailored to the particular target as well as the disease. Thank you. I'm curious on your uh, dementia studies. How are you thinking about the dosing there? Does that end up being multi-dosing or chronic dosing or? Um, so, I mean, most for the first generation will be one time. I mean, I don't know uh, for gene therapy. Yep. Um, I don't know about redosing, at least for the first generation. Um, we are looking at, it depends on the type of dementia. You know, there are some dementias that are more focal um, where you may be able to actually be able to do direct delivery. Um, so, you know, direct, inter whether it's intracranial or some other direct delivery. Um, but, I, you know, ideally we have capsids or other advances that enable this. Thanks, that's great. Patrick. Yeah, so I think for Ginkgo, our mission is to make biology easier to engineer. I think one of the reasons why biology has been so hard to engineer is that we've really been limited when it comes to design space, and particularly for cell and gene therapies, whether you're trying to engineer for uh, tropism or safety profile immunogenicity, I think there's a lot of designs that, um, uh, that our customers would like to, to explore. Um, to give you a sense of scale for how the, the field has evolved, um, I did my PhD about more than a decade ago now, um, and I designed and synthesized six new genes as part of my uh, synthetic biology PhD. Um, today at Ginkgo, uh, we're designing between five and 20,000 genes every month. Um, so we're the world's largest user of DNA synthesis. We have a partnership with 
uh, Twist Biosciences for a billion base pairs. We have our own in-house DNA synthesis uh, company. And that scale um, and the downstream automation to actually test all those designs um, is really aimed at making sure that we can help our customers identify an optimal design quickly. So, you know, from, uh, from one standpoint, uh, it's, it's simply a, a brute force, like build as much scale as you can, explore a large design space. Um, but more importantly, and uh, this is a really a lesson that we learned from our work in industrial biotech is, you know, I think there's been a lot of, a lot of work in a lot of fields of engineered biology where people build screening platforms, they get very excited about hits from a high throughput screen, um, and then it turns out that whatever they develop is very hard to scale. So I think the, the other piece uh, that's really important for us at Ginkgo is making sure that we're connecting high throughput screening and discovery um, to manufacturability. So making sure that as soon as possible, uh, new designs are being tested out in a manufacturing context um, to make sure that we're not only designing for, you know, for example, tropism, but also designing for manufacturability. And I think that's an area where we're building a lot of repeatable expertise, working with, working with partners to help make that process more predictable. That's great. I think we're gonna circle back and build on your comments and a couple more questions, so stay tuned there. Um, the next question directed at Leslie and Peter, um, specifically about partnering. How do you see uh, partnerships assisting uh, with moving some of this development forward in a more rapid fashion than we've seen historically? And uh, Leslie, you wanna lead us off? Sure, I think um, certainly at Orchard, partnership with a whole variety of, of different stakeholders and entities has been essential to the, to the progress that we've made as a company in a short period of time. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, 160 patients, 10 years of follow-up, the company's only about five and a half years old, and, and in large part that's because um, we were able to partner early on with academic centers that were the initial um, innovators of a, of a number of the different programs that we are um, developing and bringing to regulatory approval. Um, we actively partner with a number of different contract manufacturers who've enabled us to um, innovate in that space and, and continue to, to iterate and improve the efficiency and reduce the cost of goods, um, leveraging those external partnerships um, before, we, before we build in um, internal capabilities. We are also actively partnering with um, a number of institutions that specialize in the commercialization of products um, in different markets. So for example, we're launching in Europe um, with Melody currently for metachromatic leukodystrophy and also actively partnering um, with entities that allow us to, to um, uh, develop markets in, in places like the Middle East where we don't currently have expertise. And I think that given the, the different types of expertise that sit in different institutions and different organizations throughout the entire kind of ARM ecosystem, those partnerships, again, have really been essential for us to be able to move quickly and are also <coughs> essential for us to think about how we go beyond the rare diseases where we're currently specializing and think about larger indications, um, partnering with larger companies or companies that have a specific therapeutic area expertise that we can marry with the, the HSC platform expertise that we've cultivated to think about moving into different um, therapeutic areas in the future as well. It, as I recall, you've had uh, really good success with academic partnerships, UCL, UCLA, University of Manchester, I think one in Italy that escapes me, but I think many of us have struggled with those. Any secrets that you can, you know, give the audience as to why you've been successful with those academics and maybe others haven't? I think it's a reflection of, of treating these as true partnerships and leveraging the expertise that each uh, entity brings. Orchard was founded in large part by these academicians mm -hmm. who were coming together to find a way to commercialize these innovations that came out of the academic space. And I think having the roots in that space, our CEO comes from that space, for example, has been really essential for the, the credibility that we have with the academic partners in working together to advance these programs. That's helpful, thanks. Peter, your comments uh, yeah. on the partnering. No, it's a very good question and, and a huge aspect, I think, for all small companies to consider that. And I, th I would say beyond the complementary um, capabilities like disease knowledge, adding, um, adding regulatory, adding CMC aspects potentially, I mean, this is a panel about delivery and I think that's where the genetic companies are seeing more and more partnerships. Back in the day, um, delivery companies would be maybe having a licensing business model, and that's changing, right? All these new LNP companies, um, mRNA companies, they all want to do their therapeutic approaches as well. So you have to consider novel models of how to partner, maybe potentially working together on diseases instead of just licensing something in, right? And at the same time, 
um, in our field, CRISPR uh, technology, for example, I wouldn't say it's a commodity yet, but there's definitely more and more companies that are working there and there's more possibilities. So you, also the delivery companies now have the choice to select a partner and there's not only one, not like it used to be three Cas9 companies, right? I mean, there's many more now. So that um, needs to be considered as well. But I think even in, in Big Pharma, I mean, we've seen the Intellia Novartis collaboration that brought in the LNP technology and gave Intellia a head start for in vivo approaches, right? Even if it took some time, for sure, I mean, there were many challenges, but I think that's why they are leading in the field right now um, with their clinical trial and, and others are repeating that, but um, that's only due to partnerships. I mean, you, you cannot do everything, right? And then the large field of AV, I mean, we all know about the complexity of manufacturing these and, and quality control and everything, and that's where a partner that has this expertise can help substantially to move that field forward. I'm wondering as a follow-up, Peter, you, you've had a lot of experience with this, but we really saw a transformation during the most recent 18 to 20 months on partnering, you know, whether it was acquisition, whether it was investment, whether it was, uh, you know, desperation, but, but partnering seemed to occur with more speed, more efficiency, uh, due diligence, not even in person, you know, things like that. But any yeah. comments as to whether you think that will stay that way? And was that a good thing? Or, or you know, how do you view the, the transformation we've seen around the partnering? Yeah, I think, um, so what we've seen is much earlier partnering as well, right? Same like the, the financing, I mean, IPOs at very early stage. And I think we see more these class effects. So people believe now in mRNA, LMP because of the vaccines, for example. They believe in CRISPR maybe because of all the good results that came up recently. Maybe some were not as good, but safety was shown at least, right? That was a big hurdle as well, so nothing negative so far. Um, in that space, and so I think that's triggering these early partnerships, and most likely we will still see that um, coming up. And I, I also see a lot of the big companies now, they, they see the train is really moving and we have to jump on, right? And if we don't do that, then we miss it forever. There's only very few that are not yet really open to yeah. gene therapy, gene editing. Every, I mean, yeah, we have discussions with all the companies, right? There's so much interest right now, and, and it's actually, our problem to, to define what we what can we even do. Right? We're also a limited in, in size company. We have now 115 employees, but that's including diagnostics. So it's not you cannot do five six partnerships, right? So you have to really select the partner right and and go from there. Yeah. That's an interesting observation about the landscape changing because of the speed of your competitors. So you're yeah. forced to react. Um, next question we're going to address towards uh, Devin and Emil. Um, this is, um, I think, really nicely teed up by Janet's uh, comments, but, you know, ARM in a lot of ways uh, is not your prototypical uh, society or organization, as, as Janet outlined on three or four slides, all the initiatives. But I guess looking for feedback from you, you know, is how, representing the industry, how can ARM assist us better? Um, and are there solutions that, that they could facilitate on our behalf or with us some of these obstacles or hurdles that are out there that uh, we've tried to fight our way through or around for the last 10 years? And Devin, you've been doing this a long time and have seen it from a lot of different perspectives. Any, any opinions there? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important point. I think ARM, you know, having been involved with ARM since 2010 or 9, since the early, early days when it was, you know, like 20 companies or something at that time, it's been interesting to watch the evolution. I think now, with the sheer number of, of companies covering a vast array of technology, it's, it's wonderful to have that. At the same time, it becomes a real challenge, I think, for Jan and her team on how do you meet the needs of you know, the 18 different technology platforms or more that may be across all these companies. And I think there's the, the way that I think, in, in my experience, where I've seen ARM be really helpful is by participating in the committee. So the, you've, got the, you've got the regulatory work that's both in the US and Europe, very, very valuable to, to keep abreast of what's going on, as well as help influence those things. I think a lot of the uh, other work that ARM does across the science side, Mike Lemicky leads, is fantastic and can really help, I think, enable people, because there's a lot of folks now in this cell and gene therapy space who are new. Um, who haven't been in this space, they come from an antibody or a small molecule view, which is great, we welcome lots of people, but it means there's a lot of learning to happen, and I think ARM is a really valuable place for people to get up to speed very quickly on some of the key issues and challenges that you know, folks here have been you know, thinking about and dealing with for 
a long time. And so hopefully they can stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before and, and you know, keep us moving forward fast. I have to smile when you talk about the early days because I think the entire society fit into the bar at the Estancia Hotel. Yeah. And basically any of the decisions <laughs> from the day could be uh, uh, reconsidered over a drink or two and solved by midnight. Um, Emil, uh, as, as obviously uh, you're wearing multiple hats here, but as chair of ARM and yeah. as, as a member. And, uh, and, you know, we, I don't know if Devin mentioned that he is an officer and on the EC of ARM. Did you say that <laughs> you, when you were in? Okay. Um, so I would just echo what Devin said. Um, I think that ARM is, you know, the ideal place. There's two ways you can use this nexus that ARM has created. The first is to educate ourselves. Like internally, ARM is a convening force. And there are a lot of conversations that we could be having like, um, about how we want to present ourselves, what are the key issues, and ARM is the place where we can get together. If we want to talk about uh, the challenges in the delivery space, um, we, this is the place where we can do it. But it's, you know, ARM has created this uh, daily conversation with regulators and with, um, with the um, legislators, and, um, that, and that is an opportunity for the field to channel that sort of education component that Devin mentioned. So um, the issues that are important to us, we can make sure, as a, and by this I'm saying we here, the delivery people, um, can make sure that ARM is aware of the things that we care about and that those are a priority to ARM. Um, ARM is, the whole job is to listen and to promote the ideas that are of most importance, right? So a good example would be the current uh, discussion around safety issues in the AAV field. Do we have a common position on that? Mm -hmm. Have we as a group decided on how we want to respond to those questions? And then how do we want to try to educate the legislators and the regulators on that? It's a huge, it's a fantastic opportunity that we're just beginning to work on. Um, in fact, Janet, I know, has a strategic remapping, a three-year plan, and it involves more engagement with the FDA. Um, and that's a great opportunity to work with her. So um, I would say using that. And things like aging that Janet mentioned, where there's a, a best practices document, we, we can work on that as a group, as the delivery people. What does it mean to have um, viral fitness? You know, uh, how important is the dose or the empty capsid or the, the presence of the helper? Whatever those issues are can get incorporated into the new document. So um, I don't know, that's a bit of a rambling answer, but it's about your engagement mostly. Yeah, I think you raised several interesting points, and certainly from my personal perspective, we see a lot of companies entering this space that have been watching from outside, you know, closely, and, and I think as, as was said just a moment ago, they've jumped onto the train, and in some cases, they don't know the questions to ask, much less yeah. the answers, and I think certainly the experience, I, I look at, while well, we're, we're much more collaborators than we are competitors in this space. Yeah, and Everyone being successful is good for the space. And, and the regulators are willing, you yeah. know, they're willing to listen, they want to learn, they want to be educated, so it's a channel um, to use, it really is a, a give and take. Thank you. Uh, next question, we're going to uh, circle back to Emma and Devin and uh, Emil again. Um, this one um, specifically gets into a little bit more of the, the, the meaty issues, but um, thinking about indications, therapeutic indications, tissues, where do you see the current biggest gaps and how do we improve this? And I think there was a, in the introduction, there was a comment about rare diseases and then moving to the larger populations. But um, I wonder, Emma, if you could start us off on that, uh, on that thinking. Yeah, so I would say at Biogen we're focused on both. You know, the, we, we do have a um, genetic neurodevelopmental disorders unit that is looking at um, primarily pediatric neurodevelopmental disorders or monogenic diseases. And I, would, I think we think about this in terms of are, are there low-hanging fruit of, um, you know, less challenges, let's say, in the space, in particular around designing clinical trials, the size of the clinical trials, the endpoints. You know, I think that's also a major factor as far as not just the technology advances, but what is the path or the clinical tractability um, to get to approval. So these are, that's one of the areas that we look at. And then you know, on the other side of the spectrum, we have, of course work on diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. Um, and you know, for those, there may be multiple targets. And so you know, we're, we're actually pr pursuing multiple different targets for mm -hmm. these, um, as well as potentially you know, genetic subpopulations of Parkinson's disease or ALS, for example. Um, you know, so I think there's, the only approach for, from a large biopharma perspective is really to take a broad approach and tackle the big challenges like Alzheimer's. I mean, we're not afraid, of course, to, to tackle those, um, but, you know, both from gene therapy as well as all of our other modalities that we have from biologics to um, ASOs. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's different challenges for each 
each disease and it's, it's unique. It's not just the technological challenges, it's also manufacturing in some cases as well as um, you know, clinical trials. So. Yeah, I, I suspect we're gonna circle back to this, but the manufacturing side is challenging enough on the rare diseases when you start to think of uh, uh, things like dementia and diabetes and, and uh, things like that, it, it's mind boggling in some ways, but, but obviously it's an opportunity as well. Yeah, yeah, we look at um, you know, both the volume of what we would actually have to produce at commercial scale, which is you know, tied to both the dose and the um, population that we're trying to treat, um, as well as you know, just what is the platform that we're using and the quality of that platform and the scalability of that platform. Mm -hmm. And as you know, it's not just even about the commercial opportunity. When you think about late stage clinical, some of these phase three programs, you know, where we, we're challenged with 50 patient programs or 150 patients, we may be getting into the business of several thousand or more. Yeah, I mean, more. It, it, when yeah. we think about even gene therapy for Alzheimer's disease, yeah. we're looking at mm -hmm. um, two pivotals, hundreds of patients per, mm -hmm. per trial. Yep. Great, thank you. Devin, additional view from your perspective. Yeah, the, I think it. The space right now, it's really interesting. So at Arbor, we focus in two therapeutic areas. We focus in the liver and CNS. Liver, where I think you're seeing a shift to where LNPs, people are being much more comfortable with an LNP-based delivery approach. Uh, CNS, where today the, the standard is really AV, and, uh, but there's also a lot of newer non-viral and other viral approaches folks are taking. I think for us, we're agnostic to the delivery modality because what we want to do is actually start with the underlying disease pathology and then pull the right DNA effectors that allow us to, to bring that curative efficacy to whatever the, whatever the disease needs on, <clears throat> on the gene editing side. But I think the big challenge we're going to see and we'll continue to see is um, it takes a lot of patience. You think about AAV has been around a long time and we're still learning new things about it and still trying to figure it out. And I think. You know, LNPs, similarly, we're, you know, we have dosed, I don't know, billion people with LNPs now at this point or something, but we're still learning a lot more about it. And, and so these newer modalities that continue to come out for delivery may be fantastic, but the more we learn, you know, there will be warts. All of them will have warts. And so I think we just have to be patient and, and you know, find, you know, lean on history that, you know, we will work it out, but, you know, we do need to have patience. Some of the recent, you know, noise that comes out when, a, you know, companies put on clinical holder, et cetera, that's going to continue to happen because we're still learning. This is science. This isn't uh, easy. And, and I think we just have to continue to remind folks, look, cures will come, but you've got to be patient. They're not coming tomorrow. And, uh, and I think, you know, getting delivery worked out across new tissues, that's a real challenge. But lots of smart people are working on it. Yeah, I, I appreciate your last comment that you made. I was struck over the last several days just reading several articles, one on some of the safety issues with the Stellasis program, uh, some of the issues relative to uh, regulatory clinical holds, like you mentioned, or, or missed endpoints, and now uh, valuations falling. Uh, doom and gloom for the sector. And in some ways, you have to remember, this is still drug development. And when you think of the drug development world, for small molecules, guess what? There's a lot more failures than our successes. But I think people, and you, you said it well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure people are uh, sometimes step back in the long view and look at this and say, you know, there, there are not all going to be home runs and they're all not going to be instantaneous successes for those who have been working in this for decades. But Emil, last uh, comments or thoughts on this topic? Um, so your question is, where are the barriers yeah. still? Um, I mean, the barrier is either that you're, you, the specificity of your delivery, and if it's imprecise or not specific enough, then you have dose problems and off-target problems, or, or the, the capacity, meaning how much can you carry? And it's really these two levers. I mean, you can argue there's other elements to that. But, and I would say I'd flip the question around what you said and say, where do the barriers remain, and say, what have we solved? Yeah. Uh, because it's a lot easier to answer if you flip it around and you say, well, I mean, in in vivo, at least, we've, we probably have solved the liver, and, and maybe, you know, we've made good traction on the eye, and we're beginning to see some, but I, I think it's probably, you could, we could have this argument, maybe it's just the liver right now in vivo. So, so that means that, the, in answer to your question, it's everything except the liver mm -hmm. that we don't really have a firm answer for. Um, we have great ex vivo data. You know, we, can, we have approved cell therapies where we can deliver to the hematopoietic stem cell, for example. And so we know that we can do that. We can deliver to T cells. We yep. can deliver to, but in vivo um, challenges remain, and that's you know uh, one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing because I think cracking that code, 
And so you can answer the question as we have, some of the panelists have on, on indication basis or a technology basis. Mm -hmm. I was trying to flip it around. So I think the big opportunity is around engineering the hematopoietic system because those cells, uh, not only are there tens of different very powerful innate cell types there that have their own biology that you can harness, but they also penetrate every tissue and, and to contact every single cell in your body. So if you can harness that system, um, then you've, in effect, you know, gotten around some of the tissue specificity problems with delivery that we see. That's, that's our theory. Mm -hmm. No, I think here you say that, it, it, uh, I think back to uh, some of the early work with uh, hematological malignancies and the great uh, enthusiasm that did not bear out when we went into the solid tumors the first mm -hmm. time or two. And uh, I think that's a really good uh, uh, analogy. Can I expand on that? Absolutely. I think, I think it's a great point about the, the versatility of the hematopoietic stem cells mm -hmm. in terms of their ability to penetrate the tissues and and meet the delivery challenges that you can potentially face with other modalities. And we see this firsthand with, with our products that are treating neurometabolic disease. We're doing studies now looking at programs targeting um, disorders of the GI tract. We see preliminary evidence of this in, in diseases like the mucopolysaccharidosis with, with impact on skeletal structure, which have been challenges um, with other forms of, of treatment for these diseases that don't have the same ability to penetrate the deep tissues. So I, I, I would um, completely agree with your point on, on the utility of HSCs. Just to counter on that one, though, um, uh -oh. MSCs, you know, having a lot of gray hair from MSCs from uh, a long time ago, I think. Gray hair? Yeah. <laughs> no hair. Thank Some of us are no hair. Yeah. Yeah. Or no hair. Um, I think, you know, we have so much to learn about the cell, and I think HSCs are really intriguing. MSCs were really intriguing, and still are, and we still continue to learn more and more about them. So I think it, it's the wonderful part about what we do is we just continue to keep learning on the science, and you know, we're gonna learn some things about HSCs that we don't like, and we'll learn a lot of things we like, just as we have with MSCs. So I, I think, you know, again, it's, it's, it's fun to learn, but unfortunately, it can be painful, too, at times. <laughs> You wanted an easy job. You shouldn't be sitting on this panel or in this room. Absolutely. You know. Which job is that, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Take your pick. Um, I, I um, want to make sure that uh, that we bring Patrick into this conversation. So, technologies, Patrick. Um, how do you view either um, the, the 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 new delivery technologies um, and even advancements that maybe aren't quite ready for prime time yet? But but how can they help improve or solve some of these issues? Yeah, you know, I think for, for us, it's really about working with customers to figure out what their specification is and really helping them expand uh, the number of designs they can explore to, um, to look at that. I think, you know, one, one interesting example in this space is we uh, recently partnered with uh, a, a subsidiary of a genus uh, called Saponix that's working on uh, developing uh, next generation adjuvants. And we think there, there's a lot of uh, opportunities in the vaccine space, for example, to uh, improve delivery at lower doses, uh, not by uh, modifying the LMP itself, but by uh, working with um, the development of novel small molecules that can aid um, immune response. So I think, you know, again, I think uh, one of the reasons that we really like being a platform company is that um, we really, uh, we're really inspired by the innovations that our partners bring to us. And ultimately for, for us, it's, uh, you know, again, you know, I'm not going to be the expert in, uh, uh, in uh, tropism, um, but if you, if you give us a design space that needs to be explored, um, uh, that's where our automation and kind of platform approach really comes into play. And, you know, this is a, a terrible analogy, but I'm going to use it anyway. I think, you know, th think of us more as a platform uh, to enable your scientists to work better a lot uh, the same way if you were building a website today, you wouldn't uh, buy your own servers. You'd work with uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services. And so think of us really as a way to extend the reach of your R&D team and apply more, more scale. And ultimately, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's your products and your therapeutics, and we're really just there to... Uh, make sure your R&D team can be more effective. So to that point, um, we have a, seen over the years, and I think it's better now, but firms would come to us and say, I just had a very unsuccessful early stage regulatory meeting where I asked for a single pivotal trial for approval and they turned me down. Surprise, surprise. Um, and we would say, well, we, we wish you engaged us a little bit earlier in the process. Where's the right time for companies to be thinking about, you know, discussions with a firm like yours or anybody that's basically, you know, doing similar things? Yeah, I think certainly, uh, you know, the design stage is really the best uh, place, place to engage, especially because I think 
Um, with synthetic biology, there's really a dramatic expansion in terms of the toolbox that you can bring to bear on this. I think, you know, we have a couple examples on, on this panel of, uh, for example, engaging, uh, developing uh, uh, better gene editors, right? There's been a lot of innovation in that, in that space. Certainly, um, you know, we haven't discovered the, uh, all of the world's gene editors yet. Um, so I think, you know, particularly uh, at a, like with an early stage engagement, we can really make sure that we can explore um, a lot of different possibilities. That being said, um, we don't, you don't always have the luxury of engaging at that, that early point. So for example, over the course of the pandemic, we, we did a lot of partnerships that were essentially under, under duress. So you know, going back to that AWS analogy, we actually, um, when it became clear that COVID was gonna be the largest biological disaster of our lifetimes, we actually paused a, a number of our uh, commercial non-pharmaceutical projects uh, precisely so we could free up capacity on the platform. And that's where you know, the partnership with Moderna came through, where we started working with Aldevron. And if you look at, you know, one of the things about, that's interesting about the last 18 months is everything we've been able to do there are based on partnerships that were initiated, you know, um, over the last year, really. So I think it shows that, you know, you can engage midstream and make progress, especially when it's a problem that's as important as, uh, as vaccines. Okay, great, that's helpful. Uh, one last question, and then we'll throw it open to the audience. Um, and maybe, Peter, you can, you can uh, take this to start with, and then maybe Devin or Emma or others who want to. But speaking of you know, these different modalities and chances for smaller payloads, um, uh, smaller CRISPR editing systems, but just a general question, um, what are you seeing done here to enable delivery uh, coming from the payload side as opposed to uh, uh, modifying the delivery technologies themselves? Yeah, no, very good question. So as, at Mammoth, we are developing these extremely small CRISPR systems. And to give you an idea, we are talking about like one third of the size of Cas9, for example, SP-Cas9. And um, there are delivery technologies like AV, where you have a strict payload restriction, right? You have, uh, cannot go beyond 5,000, maybe um, 4,800. And so SP-Cas9 actually doesn't work for AV very well. And, and you've seen that with the editor's trial where they moved into SA-Cas9, which is a slightly smaller variant, but still I think it's, it's not the perfect uh, payload. And if you would go much smaller, then you can A, fit it into an AV, but you can also add the other components so you can create these all-in-one AV um, vectors. So you only need one vector that enters the cells and not multiple so that all the components come together to the same cell, which is, uh, I mean, very difficult, right? I mean, this has been shown working nicely um, in animal models maybe, but then if you go to diseased people, maybe a, a hemophilia patient with a liver that has been damaged already, right? That's much more difficult to get there in the same cell twice, I mean. And then um, I think also for non-viral delivery, like lipid nanoparticles, if you just have more that you can add in to one lipid, and they always stay the same size, right? Like, like 80, 90 nanometers. You can now package three times the amount into that. That's also increasing your um, efficiency, but also the stability, what we've seen of these lipids increases and stability, you need that to enter the cell actually and then um, to start the editing. So we see increase in editing efficiency with smaller systems all over. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's where small payload can help. And then there's other aspects to it. I mean, interestingly, um, We've seen that mRNA, for example, if you want to, to deliver the CRISPR-Cas system via mRNA expression, the manufacturing of smaller mRNA is much simpler than larger one. And then you would think this is small versus slightly smaller, but it, it is a huge difference. I mean, and, and so all these aspects together, right? Cost of goods, if you need less AV, then that's, I mean, per, per, yeah, preferred for the product. So there's many advantages here. It's a really interesting observation relative to the comorbidities because yeah. you know uh, it's an unusual circumstance, at least in some of the early studies where we get patients that are pristine, they generally have uh, ramifications of their disease, which ultimately we have to think about delivery, as you, yeah. as you mentioned. Uh, Devin, anything you want to add to that? Just to that uh, two pieces. I think Peter summarized it really well as to why a smaller is better. I think you know, as we get to more sophisticated editing approaches like base editing, prime editing, and you know, eventually you know, transposases where we can do whole gene rewriting. Uh, smaller is better because you're starting to couple these things together and uh, you know being able to have more space yep. to do that is important. I think the other piece that is fascinating that um, you're, you're seeing I think this because of I think the nature of the venture capital space you're, you're having a lot of um, payload companies and you have sort of delivery companies mm -hmm. but it's rare they actually start a company that's got everything 
And um, you know, it is what it is. And so I think you're going to continue to see a lot of partnerships between companies um, that have either the payload or a delivery because you know, it's an important piece of the puzzle, I think, to make that really transformational thing. So I think we will, I think, continue to see a lot more partnerships in that space, which is, which is fantastic because it will help all of us. I thought for a minute you were volunteering to start that new company. <laughs> uh, Emil, anything you want to add to that? Interesting one this morning. It was an interesting partnership this morning, right? The, the, uh, was the uh, out license to First Sight or something, right? Where they, uh, was it? Um, you mean in, in Intellia? Intellia out licensed yeah. their platform to First Sight and gave them the, the, the retinal rights um, because they, they just don't have capacity to do it, I guess. I, you could ask and tell you what the purpose was, but that's an interesting example of that where, um, and they took an equity stake in exchange for that. So they just said, you know, it's better if we <coughs> speed up and share. Um, that was just this morning. Fresh off the uh, wires. Mm -hmm. um, we're down to about the last 10 minutes, so questions from the audience. Um, it's a bit hard to see with the light shining, but uh, you could just raise your hand. Nobody has any questions in the audience. Oh, there's somebody. Panel solved them all. Yeah. Maybe while they're gathering their thoughts, any any uh, issues from the panel that we yeah. did not raise? Okay. I would like to ask a question actually to the panel. <laughs> so, um, so when in the past when I've been working with AV, the translation ability of animal models was always a disaster, right? I mean, in Hemophilia A, it was like hit and run and. And I sometimes thought we are just using the best mouse experiment to comfort management, but nobody in the science team believed this might be the best, right? I mean, you just have to pick. And then NHP, as you know, in, in, in hemophilia, you have the antibodies and you can only see the peak and then you have a, a black box, right? And you try to decide on that. But I see with LNPs, I mean, this is very different, right? I mean, it's much more translatable. I mean, we've seen with the Intellia data, but also Verf recently, the nice translation from, I mean, in vitro cells, then mouse models, and then NHP. And if that's a general observation, or is it just specific to, like, hemophilia and others where you have these antibodies coming up? And, but I think that's, yeah. Anybody have a... Uh Thought on well, I mean, do you think that's a, just the fundamental function of having an, a, a chemistry rather than biology as the delivery? I, th I think so it could be. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, lower? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah it's, I, I'll, I'll have to go read. But it sounds like a good theory. I mean, like a good, you know. Yeah. I think it also is you, you've got, in, in the gene editing examples, it's a clear biomarker because you've edited the DNA and yeah. you look at the biomarker downstream. Yeah. It's not a disease model in the NHPs, but that's okay because. It doesn't matter when you're doing gene editing. It allows you to have that translatability, like you said, Peter, which is actually fantastic because, unfortunately, translatability from animals is uh, pretty poor across the board in yeah. you know, any modality. So, it's, so it is a really promising thing, at least as far as liver goes. And, yeah. and, and hopefully we can expand that and have better translatability elsewhere, too. I do think this increases the cost of, of research, um, particularly for small companies where, you know, we basically, at Biogen, we're like, don't talk to us until you have an HP data, and it, it, it can be very expensive, especially if they're looking at, you know, if it's a platform company that's trying to apply it, how do you, you know, how do you decide where to go with that? Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's something that we may have to overcome, you know, as larger biopharma, you know, getting involved earlier and actually collaborating around um, those translatability studies. Any other questions among the panel? I wonder if just with uh, Peter and Devin, if you started with the premise that you know you were focused on small because that seemed like that was the AAV limitation at least. Is that what still is the driver right now in the field? I mean, is that what most people are coming to you asking for, or has it has your business model changed at all over the last year or two, or is it still really about we've got to get it into this 4KB capacity? I'd say for us, it's not about the AAV in particular. I think it's by making, getting the smaller nucleases yeah. that have diverse functionality, you can then begin to couple them up. So if it's epigenetic based editing, if it's a base editing or prime editing, you've got sort of a, a plug and play approach. You can put these different effectors together. So smaller is better purely from a CMC perspective and yeah. ease of use, I think is much yeah. more important, at least from my perspective. And then secondarily, if you're able to use it in, a, in an AV vector, fantastic. But it also, if you're agnostic to delivery, 
doesn't yeah. matter really what you're doing. It just makes life easier, I think, along the way. That's, that'd be our view. What about the, the idea of a transposes instead of CRISPR or something? What's, what transposes are, are a lot bigger. What are people asking for? Yeah, transposes is because you can theoretically have the ability to completely you know, do rewriting of genes. I think the key challenge there thus far is uh, finding a, trans, a transposase that works effectively in humans in a site-specific manner and doesn't have random integrations. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of a hurdle, I think, across the board for the field. There's a lot of, of companies that are working in this space, and I think we'll see some real headway in the, in the future. I, I'm curious for the panel. We've got a question right there. Orb. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a very big microphone. <laughs> very cool. So my under Lund Valentino from the National Hemophilia Foundation. So first, great panel. Um, my understanding is that drug development has followed a fairly orderly process of going from the lab into small animals and then larger animals and then into humans and doing all these studies. At the recent uh, FDA uh, Cell and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee meeting, there was a lot of debate about this paradigm, especially in terms of the dorsal root ganglion neurotoxicity that has emerged as a, you know, a potential risk with AEV-mediated gene delivery. It seems like there was the sentiment that the small uh, animal data was not representative yeah. and should be discarded. Is that really the, the beginning of sort of throwing away the decades of research and paradigm that we've built drug development on because it doesn't fit what we want it to be? Uh, or should we be thinking about, you know, the different models or different ways to look at that data? I mean, it, it's, for me, it's a safety issue. And, you know, the, the big question is, do we just discard it because it doesn't fit what we want it to say? I don't know what I do with Who wants to uh, take a first uh, crack at that? Well, I think Peter, made, you made some great comments about animal models. I think it's just another example where you can't, uh, you know, a mouse is not a small human, and we've seen that time and time again. So um, animal models you, you use as a guide, you don't use as, a, as, a, as, the, as the absolute truth, and this is just another example. Um, especially with these safety issues, many of these things don't, for example, the, it's hard to interpret, for example, the, the, the potential liver tumor genicity mo uh, risk with the AAVs. It's, um, the, these animal models are extremely sensitive to liver uh, tumors and in comparison, we think, in general, in biology to humans. So, but do you, you know, s safety issues have to be paramount. So um, I think it's just another example of where we, uh, we recognize that animal models aren't predictive. Uh, they're illustrative. Which in some ways, that's no different than small molecules or antibodies. If right. we were in this room 30 years ago talking about monoclonal antibodies, you'd have the exact same thing. Unless you wanted to go into a primate model, it wasn't predictive of either efficacy or toxicity. But, but I don't think it means we're throwing out the, mo the system because, quite frankly, what are we going to replace it with? Yeah, it's, better. Um, it's that we just have another example of where we have to be cautious, we have to be cautious in interpretation. Hmm. And on the DRG tox issue, I think um, FDA is actually looking at this on an indication by indication basis, um, and we're aware that they've actually cleared some INDs for you know very high end needs severe diseases with no treatments today um, that have known DRG talks, and um, I think it's so it's not necessarily a show stopping issue. It's it's a risk that gets weighed with the potential benefit. And I, th I think that's the purpose of the animal models is to de-risk as much as possible and go into the humans, and unfortunately you know, we're the ultimate guinea pigs for these therapies, and we will learn. Um, and hopefully, we've de-risked most, and if not all, the safety issues we can before we get there. So it is, because an NHP model's great, but as, um, you know, as Emma said, it's really expensive, and it, they're not disease models. And so looking at a healthy primate is very different than a disease human, which is very different from a disease mouse. And so it, it, it's sort of taken, I think, the sum of the data across all these things and, and working with the agency and making your best guess is that, you know, this is going to be safe and it, the benefit outweighs the potential risk. Great. We've got time for one more question here. So uh, Eric Faulkner from Novartis Gene Therapy. Uh, so a quick question on multiplexing for, you know, Emil or anyone else. So 
um, on some level, stuff's getting smaller, we're able to deliver it more cleverly, we're able to avoid the body reacting to it better than we could 26, seven years ago when I was working on gene therapies that didn't work. But from a multiplexing standpoint, we also, uh, if you look at disease, we're with gene therapy today, we're attacking disease with the rifle when we need a little bit more of a shotgun. And so any, any thoughts, you know, multiplexing is something that I've predicted for a while, you know, to come. It just is the evolution of the, of the space. But any thoughts about some of the opportunities or barriers that may be different? Yeah. Because presumably, even if you hit two targets, we could be thinking about transformative 2.0 with, with multiplexing right. if we're able to hit a couple, three things. Right. So any thoughts there would be appreciated. I would love to start. I'd just say that we were, you know, as a field, incredibly excited when we were able to, be able to engineer the intersection of one cell and one gene, CAR-T, and we created a sea change in our field. But we know that biology is effectively infinitely more complex than that, and we're just at the start of this. So, um, and and, and we've, we were very excited today, for example, CRISPR announced some data on allogeneic T cell therapy, CAR Ts, and it was great data, but it's liquid tumors. I mean, we have an, we have an entire field that hasn't been touched yet in solid tumors, as an example, and complex diseases like that. It's clear to address a solid tumor, you have to come at it with multiple angles of attack. Address the tumor, the suppressive microenvironment, stimulatory, you have to do multiple things. So, and that's just the childlike understanding we have now of systems biology. So, I think even though our tools are getting better and we can do more and more with, let, with these small systems, we still, to take full advantage of this complexity of the system, we're gonna want uh, the ability to put in many things simultaneously and hit many nodes simultaneously. So I think we have to see that as the horizon. Right, it has to be one X step. <clears throat> Just want to quickly add to the for the CRISPR field, right? and then I think Arba is doing the same thing, working on novel CRISPR systems that also have like less restrictive PAM sequences. So you can enable actually the targeting range, and with that you can do multiplexing, and that in combination with the size you could easily get three guides together with this less restrictive PAM CAS system into an AV, and and that could work, right? But it's, uh, I mean, that's requires some safety. <laughs> photos yes. as well, right? I mean, we want yes. to be sure that this is nothing that is happening today or tomorrow, but um, it will happen, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one lesson from synthetic biology is, like, for multiplexing, the more targets you have, the larger the combinatorial spaces you have to explore for tuning and optimization. So I think when it comes to, you know, what you're really talking about is designing gene circuits and logic that, that work in, in the human body, right? So that's a very complex design space, and the more we can explore that ex vivo prior to um, testing things in animals, I think the, the better, but that's really a classic systems biology problem that I think will be challenging, but can be solved with scale. Yeah. And just multiplex, I think, in vivo is it true? I mean, we've got one program now where we are going after multiplexing similar to Peter said, because it's a next generation nuclease. We have a much more confidence in the off-target profile because we really target that. So I think we're at the early days, I think, across the industry, but you're right. I think that's where, that's where the future lies, being able to go in and multiplex five, six targets at one time in, in HSC or some other cell type and, and to provide that curative efficacy, which should drive down the cost of goods significantly from, say, an allogeneic or autologous car approach we're taking today, which you know, may allow you to, perhaps the revenue's not there, but the cost of goods drops significantly. Unfortunately, I think we're gonna have to stop the discussion. Uh, I wanna really thank the panel for their outstanding contributions and uh, appreciate uh, the audience's participation. So thank you very much.